Chapter 7. Where are the dead? Where are the dead? Before we can answer the question, we must understand our relationship to life. We must realize that we are spiritual beings with fourth-dimensional powers functioning on the three-dimensional earth, but transcending it. Wordsworth sensed this fact as he wrote the Ode on Intimations of Immortality. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life's star, hath had elsewhere its setting, and cometh from afar. Not in entire forgetfulness, and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God, who is our home. The next world is not situated on some distant planet, but is actually all around us in the very air that we breathe. Your loved one, whom you call dead, is carrying on his life right where you are now, but he is existing in his new body. You do not see him because he is now functioning in a body of vibration too high for your mortal eye to register. You do not collide with him for the same reason that one radio program does not interfere with another. You and he are just on different wavelengths. Your body is dense, his body is etheric. Your mind is functioning on an alternating current. His mind is functioning on direct current. Death is just the change from one frequency or rate of vibration to another. It is the process of exchanging the lower speed for the higher. It makes no change in the real man at all. In fact, we still be the same one minute after death as we were one minute before death, except for appearance, and the difference is no more significant than the exchange of a winter suit for a summer one. The effect of a change in frequency vibration, which is exactly what the transition from the mortal body to the spiritual body is, was brought about beautifully in Stuart Edward White's analysis of the movement of an electric fan. Take the electric fan, a fan of two speeds. The low speed will label 50 and the high speed 100. We set the fan revolving at 50. It will go right on revolving at 50 indefinitely, though its overall frequency is 100. In other words, without disturbing the potential of 100, we have arrested the fan's motion at 50. Now, forgetting about 100 being a potential, we push the control lever into high, with the fan going twice as fast as before. We note a curious effect. Whereas at 50, we could see the blades clearly. Now we don't see them at all. We look right through them at the wall behind. Jesus said, We see as through a glass darkly. At another time he said, If any man hath eyes to see, let him see. The truth of the matter is that we see only that which is our own level or frequency. Fleshly bodies see only fleshly bodies, while spiritual bodies see only spiritual bodies. Just as you cannot see two sides of a coin at the same time, so you cannot see a spiritual body while you are still functioning in the physical body. To quote White again, Did you ever see two sides of a coin at one time? You could do that only with mirrors. Yet, seeing one side of a coin, you do not deny the existence of the other side, or that both sides belong to the same coin, and thus it is with death. Death is but a change of frequency, a change from low visibility to high visibility. In this phase of life, as in every other, there can be no growth, progress, or unfoldment without change. This mortal body is dropped off so that the person who is said to be dying may assume another body suited to a new environment. We who are left behind no longer see the body or the blades, because the one who has made the change is now vibrating at a speed of a hundred, while we are still functioning at a speed of fifty. Birth and death are two ends of the same thing. One is no more to be feared than the other, for each has purpose in God's plan. As someone has widely stated, when we are in complete tune with the infinite, we shall see the invisible. The whole atmosphere above us and all about us is full of life, full of the angels of God, full of ministering spirits, and our loved ones walking unseen beside us. This is a universe of life and not of death. You cannot destroy life. You can change its appearance and its relationship, but that is all that can be done. You can kill the body, but the only release the soul into true element, give it wings for flight from eternity. Do you grieve because you no longer see your loved one? Then realize that the reason you do not see him is that the body he is now wearing is not visible to your physical eyes. He may be standing beside you right now in this spiritual body, but you and your physical body are unconscious of his presence. Will I ever see him, you ask? Most certainly. When? When you go to sleep tonight. Sleep, you see, is a sort of temporary form of death. In fact, in many ways, you will never be any more dead than when you go to sleep tonight. In natural sleep, all trace of personality is lost. You are out, so to speak, and you enter into the same body as the one into which your loved one has passed. You are one with him in perfect consciousness, and your union with him is in every way as full as it used to be. The only difference between those whom you call dead and those whom you call alive is a difference in consciousness and a difference in rate of vibration. 
The dead go to sleep in one room and wake up in another room, but you wake up in the same room. You will continue to wake up in the same room until the silver cord that keeps you in a natural body intact is broken. That which separates you finally from the physical body is the breaking of the silver cord. But until that time comes, you will continue to slip in and out of your physical body every 24 hours. When the cord is cut, your friends will call you dead, but actually you will be more alive than ever before. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. When man can bridge the gap between going to sleep and waking in the morning, he will never shed another tear, for he will then know what immortality is. When he can remember what happens during natural sleep, he will know that there are no dead. In the meantime, we shall not labor under the illusion that we have lost our dead, but shall realize that the only difference between them and us is that we are with them during the night while we are asleep, and seem to be away from them during the day. In other words, death brings only a change of relationship, for it reverses the process of living. When we see death as an incident in life, we shall never think of our loved ones as being away from us. Lo, I am with you always. You ask, what will be the nature of the life we are to live after death? We can answer that very well and very similar to our present life. Eternal life is a present possession. It is the Christ life within us. The perfect will remain, and the imperfect, the ungodlike, will pass away. It will be a spiritual life, as we shall abide in the home of the soul. We shall not be less human, but more really and ideally such. Three things we shall take with us from this life into the next. Our thoughts, our feelings, our wills. What the character of that life shall be depends very largely upon what the character of our present life is. Where are the dead? In the Father's house, consciousness. We and the dead dwell in different rooms, in different states of consciousness. Morrison said, It is all one house, it is all the Father's home, and we and the dead but dwell in different rooms. Not into any farther country do we travel. It is only a passing from one room to another, a step through the veil into a brighter chamber. You would not weep if you could see things as they really are. Jesus said, I am come that your joy may be full. You look after a loved one with tear-dimmed eyes, but if you could follow that one into the glory of the temple not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, you would rejoice. If you could see the things you think are causes for sorrow as God sees them, they would appear to be blessings. Someone has well said, if Mary had found the body of Jesus in the tomb as she expected to do, it would have been a cause for grief. The empty tomb at which she grieved was the reason for the world's hope. Mary did not recognize Jesus, how needless her sorrow was. We often speak of our loved ones as though they were swept out of existence. It is difficult in our hour of grief to conceive that they have simply changed their relationship to us. We say of the sun at evening, it is gone. And gone where? It is simply faded from our vision to shed its light on some other part of the globe. Our loved ones have simply gone to function in another state of consciousness and another body, and to shine in another realm. Where is this other realm? Right where we are. In my Father's house are many mansions. What tremendous power is expressed in these words? What radiant hope? In an old and treasured sermon of an unknown source, the author asks and answers this question. If energy can be transformed, but cannot be destroyed, then why should life, which is a form of energy, end at the change called death? If ether, so fine in texture as to be invisible, yet a substance fills space and without break or puncture interpenetrates matter, then is it not conceivable that the soul after death inhabits a spiritual body and a substance akin to ether, and exists in a spiritual realm that interpenetrates our world? The words of Jesus, in my Father's house are many mansions, are descriptive of a spiritual realm no more mysterious than is life in our material world. The two worlds may not be far apart, sugar dissolved in water is invisible, yet it is there. Likewise, the spiritual interpenetrates the material. Heaven is here all around us, and it will be to us here and hereafter just exactly what we are to it. Your dead are near to you, rest assured, that the two planes of activity on which the living and the so-called dead function may be superimposed is readily within our comprehension. Surely, when we live our lives surrounded by the mysteries of creation, when we depend upon natural laws for our movements and our sustenance, the acceptance of the knowledge of the continuity of life should not be difficult. Verse, Journey's End The Spirit shall return to God who gave it. We go from God to God, then though the way be long, we shall return to heaven, our home at even song. We go from God to God, so let the space between be filled with beauty conquering things base and mean. We go from God to God, lo, what transcendent bliss, 
to know the journey's end will hold such joy as this. Evelyn Healy, 